All right, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome again to Marquette University Law School. I'm Mike Goucher, and this is On the Issues. This is our continuing series of conversations with news and policymakers, people doing interesting, important work in this region and beyond. Today, we are delighted to be joined by two familiar faces uh, in Wisconsin politics. Uh, seated next to me is the Democrat, Dave Obey. Congressman Obey served in Congress for 42 years, from 1969 to the beginning of 2011. And seated next to Congressman Obi is Congressman Tom Petri, who served East Central Wisconsin for 35 years, uh, just retiring in early 2015. Won't you please give them both a warm welcome to Marquette Law School. Under a panel show. Uh, Congressman Obi and Petri are here as part of, uh, of what they've called a civil dialogue tour. So they've been going to places around the state uh, talking about uh, the fact that we can uh, disagree on the issues, but do it in a civil way, that maybe compromise isn't a dirty word, although we'll talk about that, Congressman Petri. I know we, we were having an interesting discussion about that word earlier uh, when they arrived. But we want to welcome them uh, to Marquette Law School. And before we begin, I do want to uh, mention that uh, we appreciate the efforts of the Wisconsin Institute for Public Policy and Service, the OB Civic Resource Center, Wisconsin Humanities Council, and Wisconsin AARP, all of whom helped us uh, put this event together today. So we are delighted to have uh, both of these uh, distinguished gentlemen with us today. So I, I said you're doing this uh, civic dialogue tour. Uh, some people have called it the bipartisanship road show. Um, Congressman Obi, why are you doing this? Well, I'm doing it because I have uh, a great respect for the political process. Uh, it's, it's the only thing that stands between us and chaos. My good friend John Hume uh, from Northern Ireland, who was, uh, who, who was uh, nine times the target of assassinations by the IRA and by uh, the opposite side in, in the uh, Ireland uh, uh, Troubles, uh, John said to me once, I don't understand uh, your countrymen. Don't they understand that, that politics is a peaceful substitute for war? And he said, if they don't understand that, tell them to look at my country. So I just think it's important that people understand that, first of all, two people with different views can still be friends, as we are and have been for years. Mm -hmm. I think it's important also uh, that, that people understand what the causes are of the incredible polarization that's taken place in, uh, in our political system. And uh, I hope at the same time that we can uh, convince young people, uh, maybe only a handful uh, at, at a time, that uh, they need to pay attention to what's happening in politics because like it or not, over the next 30 or 40 years, there will be profound changes that will impact people. Uh, you have, you have uh, some very influential people in this country willing to spend a whole lot of money to turn things out their way. And if people are going to balance that off uh, by insisting that government follow the needs of the many rather than the few, uh, we've, got to, we've got to get to young people and make them understand what's at stake. Congressman Petri, give me your perspective. Why, why did this, this sort of joint venture appeal to you? Well, actually, uh, when I, when I uh, 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 retired uh, in J January, a couple of months passed, and suddenly the phone rang one day, and who should be on the other line but Dave Obey? And he said, uh, uh, how about the two of us going around and talking to some community forums and uh, uh, appearing at, at different colleges and universities in the state and civilly disagreeing and talking about how Congress has changed during the time uh, uh, we each were there and uh, uh, maybe uh, 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 civilly disagreeing on some of the issues of the day and that kind of thing. He said, I, I, I've got a lot I want to get off my chest. <laughs> well, that sounds like said, we're going to have a good I said, well, Dave, I, I, don't, I don't have anything to get off my chest, but I'll be happy to give it a try. So I've been kind of going along, and uh, uh, I think uh, we've had a good uh, 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 opportunity to talk to a lot of students and other people. And as Dave said, one of the things that uh, we've tried to emphasize is that, that uh, we've got a great country. We've inherited, we have problems, but we also have a lot of opportunities and a lot of things that work 
very well. But we can't take it for granted, and it means that people have to get involved when they have the opportunity. To, uh, and it's not just in Washington at the national level in elected office, but people serve without much or any pay on school boards and city councils, all kinds of civic organizations, putting something back so that what they've received is available for the next generation. And you can't just complain, and you, you can't uh, just expect someone else to do it. At some point, for the system to work, uh, people have to step up to the bat and assume responsibility, and so we've been talking about all that. that. Uh, let's spend a few minutes talking about the institution that <clears throat> both of you know so well, uh, the House of Representatives, and, and Congress on a larger uh, scale here. Um, you see the public opinion uh, polls. Uh, they show about 12 or 13 percent of Americans uh, think Congress is doing a good job. Um, First, how does that make you feel when you see that? And, and second, why is that, from your perspective? Well, Congressman Barney Frank was asked that question a while back. He said, Congressman, uh, co politicians are held in such low repute, how do you account for that? And Barney gave a couple of reasons, and then he said, but let's face it, he said, uh, he said often, uh, he said, there, there's a lot of constituents I don't think much of either. <laughs> 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 but, but I, I mean, obviously, uh, I, I, you can I, say I, that now, can't you? <laughs> you used to you may have thought that at some point, but you, now you can say it. You, given my reputation, <laughs> you may have said it. <laughs> I, I said it often. But um, uh, now I forgot the question. No, I mean, why, why is it? Why, why do we have such a, a low opinion of Congress? Well, I, I think there are a number of reasons. First of all, uh, I think the public is fed negative stories 24 hours a day. I think one of the worst things ever happened to this country is a 24-hour news cycle. Uh, and so you have self-selected uh, viewing of news. If you're a liberal, you watch CNN. If you're a conservative, you watch Fox. If, you, if, if you're... Uh, in the, if you're in the middle and don't know what to think, you watch CNN. And uh, uh, so you, you, you have this constant negative drumbeat. Secondly, um, politicians themselves tear down the system. Uh, uh, oh, everything in Washington's crazy. I'm a good guy, but everything else is nuts. That's what you get from so many politicians. <coughs> and thirdly, you have... Uh, uh, the, the fact that the public recognizes that politicians have stopped delivering the goods for regular people. I mean, when you see uh, over the past 10 years that uh, out, of, out of an 80% increase in worker productivity in this country, all, workers have only seen 4% of that go into their own pockets. Uh, when you see uh, so much happen that benefits the economic elite, uh, and very little for, for middle and low income people. It's no wonder that people think that, uh, that politicians aren't, uh, are, are, aren't doing much for them these days because they aren't. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you think? Are, are politicians to blame for, for the low job approval or, or are there other factors in addition well, to that? Well, I, I honestly think when you look at what, the way our system was set up, uh, when the f people discovered that the they needed to have a stronger central government and bargained uh, a, a treaty or a compact called the Constitution of the United States, which is a compromise. Uh, they, they really uh, ended up uh, uh, setting up, they didn't trust strong central government, but they knew they needed it. So they set up a system of checks and balances and they didn't want any group or individual to have too much power. And, and th this is frustrating. But it's essential in order to maintain our country, our freedom, and on an even keel. So it's just built into the system. And I spent a lot of time after I was there for a while, look, thinking, uh, reading some of, some of the founders wrote that the American government was based on the consent of the governed. It didn't say the support of the governed. There's a lot of delay and argument and debate that goes on, and finally, people say, "Oh, all right, we'll." work it out for the time being and come back and fight another day. And that, that's built into the process. Uh, that that's talks about uh, compromise or speaks to compromise. But yeah, you and I were talking before we began this event, uh, Congressman Petri, about compromise and how it's viewed in today's political arena. Not necessarily viewed as a positive word. It somehow means something different. Yeah. 
That's happened, of course, before in our history. Uh, in the period leading up to the Civil War, people compromised uh, one way and another to avoid the nation breaking up. And finally, the compromise became a bad word, and we ended up uh, uh, with this terrible civil war. People said you couldn't compromise principle. Now that's becoming compromise, starting to become a bad word with some as well. And there's a fellow, I was at a conference in Washington the other day, there's a fellow, one of these pollsters, you see him on TV occasionally, Frank Lutz, who advises candidates and pollsters, and they do a lot of polling on how words ring. And it turns out that when they did polling of people in my party, uh, and were asked if they, what they thought about compromise, people compromised, it was very negative. On the other hand, if they asked, if they liked people who found common ground, it was very popular. So they said, no, don't talk about compromise anymore. Talk about trying to find common ground. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, I don't know if that means anything, but that's, that's how the dialogue changes. Congressman Obi, how much of, of what we see uh, in today's um, political world is due to the fact that it seems like each party has sort of moved either further left or further right, and in part because of the way congressional districts are drawn. How much does that play in this, this well, difficulty let, to work together? Let me put it in a broader context. When I went to Congress, it was in the middle of the Vietnam War, and there were a lot of members who were against that war, and they couldn't get at it. And some of those members were so angry about the war that they hated Richard Nixon, they hated LBJ, they hated the congressional leadership, and even if you agreed with them on the need to end the war, if you differed with them on how to do it, somehow you were morally defective. And it was a really uh, nasty, nasty tone that was set. And that nonsense was, was coming from liberals. Uh, today, I think it's just uh, the opposite of that nonsense has emerged on the right, John Boehner being an example of uh, what happens. When Johnson passed the Civil Rights Bill, he changed politics in this country forever. He knew he was slowly but surely handing the South over to the Republican Party. And what happened is that the Republican Party, which had been at that time a fairly homogenous party of, uh, led by the business community, uh, Added to that were the old Wallace Democrats who converted to the Republican Party in the South, a lot of the evangelicals. And over time, you, you built up a, an unstable coalition between the business group and the Republican Party and, and, uh, and the more anti-group uh, largely focused in the South. And then the economy went to hell under, uh, under uh, uh, President Bush, and we had the Tea Party elected uh, shortly thereafter. And so you had about 40 members uh, in the Republican caucus who didn't have any experience in government. They, did, they, they didn't have any experience in compromising with somebody else. And so they say to Boehner, you can't compromise, and if you do, we're going to bounce you. And they, they threatened to offer a resolution removing him from the speakership. Um, and uh, the, in addition to those 40 people, you've got about 80 more who simply don't want to have to face primaries, and they know that if they go along, if they don't go along with the hard rock 40s, that a lot of them are going to face primaries. And so that, that has confused things. Add to that uh, the fact that uh, that uh, you mentioned the problem. It, to me, the two things that I want people to do in the end is number one, recognize what you have to do to get, uh, to reduce greatly the influence of money in politics. And second, uh, what they have to do in order to change the polarization in this country by changing the way districts are drawn. Uh, the fact is, when I went to Congress, over a third of the, of the House seats were competitive. Some years the Republicans could win, other years the Democrats could win. Um, that's changed today so that less than 10% of the seats for the House of Representatives are competitive. If you've got 90% of the politicians in the legislature or in the Congress who know that no matter what the public thinks, they can do whatever they damn please, 
what's going to happen is that there is no incentive to work with anybody except your own political base. And that, uh, and that means that if people like John Boehner, who has larger responsibilities as speaker to balance off uh, the views of different groups, that means they are caught in the squeeze by, by people who become politically radical. And we, so I, I don't think this is going to really be solved until we change the way that, that uh, legislative and congressional districts are drawn by going to some kind of a commission form, at least in first instance. Even in states where the state constitutions require that uh, the legislature do it all, uh, there's, there's no reason you still can't have a citizens commission which, dra which produces the first draft uh, the, so that if the legislature then says, no, we're going to do it a different way, they then have to explain why they have moved away from that bipartisan standard. I want to I talk a little bit more about uh, uh, Speaker Boehner's departure and the arrival of Paul Ryan uh, in that job. But, but I did want to ask Congressman Petri about this, this notion that there's pressure uh, facing elected officials. And I mean, in your district, um, I know you're proud of your conservative record. You know it's a strong conservative record. Mm -hmm. And yet, in the last election cycle, had you chosen to run for re-election, you would have faced a challenge from the right. What, what does that say about where our politics are? Well, it may, part of it is just, I think, uh, when you, after you've been in for a while, <laughs> people like a change. I don't, <laughs> Dave was in 42 years. That was a pretty good run. <laughs> I was in for 35 years. Uh, my wife had been telling me people were getting a little tired of me after a while anyway, and uh, I, I decided she, maybe she was right. So I, I, don't, I, I think uh, 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 there is that sort of thing. There, there have been uh, primary challenges in both parties increasingly over the years, and people in both parties are worrying about uh, their, their base. Uh, but if you look at what's hap what happened in the last go-around in... Uh, around the country. The worst fight really happened in Mississippi, Thad Cochran. Uh, they ended up with a runoff. Uh, he ended up winning. And uh, in a number of other uh, uh, situations like that, in fact, uh, there were challenges, but th they were not uh, uh, successful. Uh, but you, you run into, I mean, what's your, is your purpose doing the job or is your purpose running around arguing with people and engaging in this kind of thing? And I figured I'd had a pretty good run at it and I'd give someone else the chance. If I, if I could just mm -hmm. make one point. One of the problems is that there are two things politicians are supposed to do. The first thing is they're supposed to define their differences so that when, they, when people go to the polls, they know what they're getting when they vote for this character or that character. Um, but after they've defined their differences and they've gotten elected and they wind up with 435 people with different pressures, then you have an obligation to reconcile those differences. And the political system has become very good at defining differences and not worth a tinker's you-know-what in terms of resolving them. And so when you get people elected, who think their only job is to go to Washington and hold their breath and turn blue. And when they think that somebody who, uh, who tries to do something different is disloyal to the party, it, it, it doesn't work. David Brooks wrote something that I think is instructive. For those of you who don't know him, he's a conservative political columnist in the New York Times, very civilized guy, kind of like Mike Boucher. <laughs> <laughs> a lot smarter, but, but, but I appreciate and, that. And here's what he said. He said, politics is the process of making decisions amid diverse opinions. It involves conversation, calm deliberation, self-discipline, the capacity to listen to other points of view, and balance valid but competing ideas and interests. But this new Republican faction regards the messy business of politics as soiled and impure. Compromise is corruption. Inconvenient facts are ignored. Countrymen with different views are regarded as aliens. And any compromise was regarded as a blood betrayal. Now, when John Boehner put this latest budget deal together this week, he wasn't betraying anybody. He was doing his job. That's what you do if you're a leader. Uh, and, and, and so, as I say, this stuff is cyclical. Uh, sometimes the nonsense comes from the left, sometimes from the right, but, but, but it's still nonsense. 
Congressman Petri, can uh, let's talk current events for for just a moment. Uh, Congressman uh, Obi mentioned the the budget deal, um, which would get us past the election cycle. Um, but you've got a new speaker, or, or soon to have a new speaker, probably as soon as tomorrow. Um, can Speaker Ryan uh, succeed where Speaker Boehner wasn't able to succeed with part of his party, which had grave doubts about the way the speaker was conducting business? Well, I think he can. It, it, obviously, it's not something he really sought. No. Uh, and uh, I think he would prefer that chalice not come to his lips. But he finally decided, I think, after consulting with a lot of people, that even if there was not complete unanimity within the Republican caucus, it was close enough to unanimity that he could be chosen as speaker and he had an obligation to, to uh, the uh, country basically to, to, to step into the, uh, the void. If he hadn't, there would have been a, probably Boehner would have had to stay on as a lame duck for some uh, considerable period of time. When he made his announcement, I, he put out a statement saying that he thought that uh, he, he wanted to provide the kind of leadership that meant that the House of Representatives was going to st stop ob objecting to things and arguing against things and proposing things and being positive, offering solutions to things. Uh, if he can get, get cobbled together the votes to do that, uh, I think people will, will uh, be pleasantly surprised. It's not an easy job, but uh, if anyone can do it, I think he's the guy who can do it. I notice you used the word if a couple of times, if he can do it. Uh, do you think he's going to be able to do it based on your experience in that body? Well, I th I, people do learn from experience. And I been a, was a member of the Republican caucus, and we'd get together once or twice a week, and people would all, all have a chance to stand up and say their piece, and a lot of arguing within the tent back and forth about different things. And uh, people, Boehner would, other leaders would ex try to explain that they, at the end of the day, had to get the acquisition of the Senate and it had to be signed by the president or they had accomplished nothing, they would be back. At, uh, it made their point, but they wouldn't have been governing. And uh, uh, they tried it their way a number of times and it hasn't worked particularly well. And so I think now they're going to, there'll be a little bit of a honeymoon for uh, uh, Paul and if he can uh, gr grab that opportunity and build some momentum, find some uh, common ground that uh, uh, they can unite around uh, that's positive, uh, I, people can be, uh, will be surprised. I think. Uh, Congressman Obi, I'm going to have you uh, weigh in on this too. I mean, you were the chair of a very powerful committee, the House Appropriations Committee. Um, Paul Ryan loved his work with Ways and Means. Um, can he succeed as speaker? Well, it depends on whether or not the people who forced Boehner from power <coughs> grow up, in my view. <laughs> he puts and, things more bluntly. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the problem is that what I learned in short order when I was chairman of appropriations is that that chairmanship didn't give me a license to impose my uh, agenda on 435 other people. It simply gave me the privilege uh, of, uh, of trying to work out uh, hundreds of differences with 435 other people so that eventually I could find enough votes to get two to 218, which is what you have to, ha have to pass anything in the House. And so you have to negotiate hundreds of compromises with individual members with, with other committees who have a different view than you do. And what, what the, a lot of these folks who pushed Boehner out <coughs> didn't understand is that that's the role that leadership has to play. If you're a rank and file first termer, uh, you don't have to do that. You can hold your breath and you can scream and shout so long as somebody else in the end helps to get to 218. Uh, and there is no reason why they shouldn't be, uh, be uh, willing to follow Ryan, because Ryan is not a, quote, soft, moderate liberal. It's a conservative Ryan is guy. a committed conservative. And if you don't think so, look at his budget. His are the budgets 
that wanted to privatize Medicare. His are the budgets that wanted to cut education. His are the budgets that uh, that uh, uh, required cut, deep cuts in food stamp uh, pr programs. That's not a liberal agenda. And so if the people who pushed Boehner out uh, will just take a few breaths and understand that somebody just might have a bit of wisdom outside of their own circle, then he can get things done. But if they, if they continue this chest pounding, uh, then sooner or later a hot button issue will come up and Ryan will face the same thing that Boehner did. So it all depends on, on, uh, on how reasonable uh, they become. The uh, next uh, GOP presidential debate is tonight in Boulder, Colorado. And I want to begin with Congressman Petri on this. Um, but, but each of you can uh, address this. Um, if you look at the polls right now, the people faring best in the polls are people who have zero uh, experience in elected office. <coughs> zero. Donald Trump and Ben Carson. And you know, if you add Carly Fiorina to the mix, you're probably over 50% of the people uh, who are polled, um, GOP likely voters. What does that say? Why, why are people more willing, it seems, at this point in time to entrust their futures to people who haven't had any experience with how government works um, and, and not with people who do have experience in that? Well, it beats me. I <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I mean, Dave and I are from, we're, we're sort of contemporaries in politics in right. a sense. And uh, the, uh, you, I think uh, whenever you sort of start becoming aware of the political process, uh, you're in your teens or whenever it is in your life, that whoever is elected as president, and that sort of makes an impression on you. And it shows in the polls later. When young people came up when Reagan was president, they kind of liked him and they tend to be more Republican. So in our case, uh, we, we are in that sense Eisenhower babies. We, 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 he was the first president I was aware of. Uh, uh, he didn't have any electoral uh, experience. But he certainly had a lot of government experience and leadership experience. And the more I've learned about his career, the more I discovered he knew. He was sitting in, in the, up on the hill for years representing the War Department and the budget process and so on as the Congress was appropriating things. He knew how the process worked very, very well and was a, uh, his ranking as a president still, still goes, goes higher. Uh, I think myself that we're still in the early stage of the process. That we were in a daily news cycle. Things are moving a lot faster. It's still going to be another several months before people have to gather in Iowa and then in New Hampshire and the, the actual voting occurs. So I think we're still at the age of people, or at the stage of people sitting around and sort of saying what they sort of, their, their fantasy or what they would wish rather than saying, is this really who I want to hire to make the decisions for myself and my family and my grandchildren about whether we go to war or not and to deal with the different international and domestic pressures that uh, you have to deal with and, and you know, in our own country to, to pull us together and get things done. Uh, it's a big field, so it's easy to lead in a field with 20 or 25 Percent, but I would suspect that you'll see it, uh, it will not uh, go up to 50 percent for the people who are leading in the on the Republican side right now. And if someone else doesn't emerge uh, uh, but, but during the primary process, we'd end up with a brokered convention. Would you be shocked if, if uh, at, at some point uh, Donald Trump were the the nominee as a longtime Republican, would you be shocked if that was your party's nominee? Well, if he's going to implement the program based on his record of contributions and support for people in the past, I would be quite shocked <laughs> <laughs> as a Republican. Okay. Uh, what do you think of what's happening in the Republican Party? You think it's you're surprised that at this stage of the campaign that, that Trump and Carson are still leading? Well, I mean, when people say they're going to elect somebody like Trump or Carson, Here's what they're saying. Uh, I have to have surgery next Wednesday, and so I think I'm going to go to a carpenter. <laughs> <laughs> that's, 
what they're saying is that experience doesn't count. And, uh, you know, it's funny, but it ain't. It's scary. I mean, the, I mean, the, the idea that Donald Trump uh, could convince this country that he can be nuanced enough and subtle enough and wise enough to deal with all of the complications in the Middle East. Um, it's amazing. And, and, and I, I think Carson's candidacy shows what's wrong with Trump. The only reason Carson is getting uh, the numbers he's getting is because he ain't Trump. <laughs> and they're looking for somebody else who is outside of the normal political uh, circles. And so Trump is bombastic. A lot of people are tired of that already, and so they say, I want something different, and the guy who's the most different from Trump is Carson, just because of his low-key speaking style. And uh, uh, I mean, I, I think unless something drastic happens, you will have a, a, a brokered, brokered convention. If you do, who, who, who do they turn to in a brokered convention? Joe Biden. <laughs> no. Who do they turn to, Carson? <laughs> well, there are a lot of possibilities. Uh, it's not unheard of that people run more than once for president, and sometimes it takes a while. I, I think um, uh, 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 former Governor Romney is. is, mm. is uh, <clears throat> there's no one who doesn't think he's a very able person with a lot of, with political experience and, and so on. Uh, uh, if they had to turn to him, I think that he would be a, a very uh, uh, good president. Uh, there are a number of other people. You could, one of the current candidates could emerge mm -hmm. from that situation. Uh, you could see John Kasich as an example. He's had experience in the House of Representatives as governor of uh, Ohio. Uh, and uh, is well, was well liked uh, and respected as a hardworking representative by people in both political parties when Dave and I served with him. Uh, there, there, there are a number of other people like that that, that come to mind. Uh, Paul Ryan ran for vice president. He's well known nationally. Maybe he'll hit a trip, uh, you know, a home run. <laughs> so I hear what's interesting though, for both of you, you're not saying this casually. You think a broker convention is a very real possibility. Is that correct, or am I overstating that? I, I, I haven't sat down, which you'd have to do, and look at the, at the uh, delegate selection rules for each of the primary states. If, uh, and, and it's not hard to do, I just uh, didn't take the time to do it. It's, but if, if it's proportional, that is to say, it, when there's the the primary in say New Hampshire and Trump gets 20 percent and Bush gets 25 percent and Rubio gets 20 or so on, so they get that roughly that percentage of delegates. Then and that happens in a lot of states. Then it's very likely that there won't be 50 percent of the delegates for any one person. If it's winner take all and someone who gets 20 percent of the public gets 100 percent of the delegates, then. I, it probably won't be a broker. Congressman Obi, you're also a student of history. What do you, uh, am I overstating it when I say you think there is at least a possibility that there could be a broker convention? No, I mean, I, I cannot believe that the people who have been the establishment in the Republican Party for, for, for the last generation uh, will let uh, candidates emerge like Trump or to a lesser extent, Carson. Uh, I, just, uh, I just think they will move heaven and earth to try to provide a more traditional nominee than that. I want to uh, take a, a moment to ask you each about legacies and-, and We should talk know. about the Democratic primary. Well, we should talk about it. Actually, that's a good point. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about that. <laughs> okay. You should do this, you know, they're, they're good at this. Um, that's a good point, because uh, I saw an interview with you, Congressman Obi, back in the spring, and, and at that point, I think Hillary Clinton was pretty much the only uh, serious Democratic candidate. But now you have the Bernie Sanders phenomenon. Are you surprised by the sort of um, showing he's made, at least in public opinion polls so far, and in terms of fundraising and organization? 
I'm very surprised uh, by, by the fact that Bernie has done so well. And I'm very surprised at how well he has performed on television. Uh, Why do you say that? Beca beca <laughs> because he has, he has been a huffer and puffer for a long time. And um, uh, as he moved to the Senate, he had some institutional responsibilities that he didn't have in the House. And so instead of uh, be being another rank and file member who would, uh, uh, who would simply push for what he believed in, he had responsibilities that required him to balance uh, out uh, interest as he, as he dealt with veterans issues as well as now ranking member of the Budget Committee. So uh, I had not paid that much attention to those changing responsibilities. And I think that's why he has, he has done so well, because he has, he, he, he's, he's learned to, to deal with a broader approach to things. Um, uh, and, and I don't know how long he is going to stay at the level he's at. I think in the end, Hillary is going to do quite well. But uh, uh, it is a surprising phenomenon. But when you step back and think about it, we shouldn't be surprised because he is the person who, with most clarity, is talking about the need to do something about the, the obscene gap in income that has developed in this country. And, and people think that he's not just saying it, he has it in his gut. Yeah. You made an interesting com uh, comment to me earlier, Congressman Petri, about the, the Sanders, and I don't want to call it a phenomenon, that kind of probably diminishes it, but um, his showing. And also the interest in Donald Trump and Ben Carson on the Republican side. These are people who are just not happy with the way things are going in America. And so they're looking for something quite different than what they perceive as politics as usual. Mm -hmm. Would you say that? Well, I see a lot of the basis of uh, uh, Sanders' support being somewhat similar to that that uh, Senator Obama had when he was running against Hillary. Uh, Except I mean, Obama had extra support because people hoped and felt that there was some possibility that electing a black person as president would be uh, kind of put closure to all the difficulties of the civil rights era and slavery and show that everyone, anyone can aspire to be president and it was good for the country. So I think there was a lot of, of feeling that this was a, a positive feeling toward that candidate as an able man and so on, lacking in depth of experience. Uh, that uh, uh, certainly uh, uh, then Senator Hillary Clinton had, or that that uh, a lot of other other people had. Uh, uh, Sanders, uh, I mean, people. I think there's level, some legitimate concern about a, a two billion dollar uh, foundation suddenly emerging from in, in a few years out of from God knows where. And if this was in another country, we would say this is a very odd thing indeed. Uh, so uh, there's that reluctance, then a lot of all the money. And so I think you see a lot of people m making small contributions to Sanders, sort of <clears throat> partly in protest, uh, looking for, uh, just saying they, they don't really approve of the way that is. They don't want to be taken for granted and, and have this uh, uh, thing foisted, foisted on them. I mentioned earlier uh, uh, legacies, and I know uh, people like yourselves are probably not fans of that word, um, but, but I do want to ask you what you're most proud of. Uh, 42 years in, in Congress, you dealt with a lot of big issues, Congressman. What, what uh, as you look back, uh, what are you most proud of? Who? Oh, you? Me? Yeah. <laughs> He's got 35 years. years. <laughs> well, I, I would hope uh, that after I kicked the bucket, that uh, uh, people would uh, re recall that I was always in the corner of average working people and tried to do everything I could across the whole array of issues to give them a better shot in life. Uh, in terms of specific uh, legislative accomplishments, I'm proud of the role that I played working with George Bush Sr. Uh, after uh, the Iron Curtain fell, uh, uh, and, and we had to find a way to help Eastern Europe transition from uh, Marxist-oriented uh, uh, 
dictatorships to market-oriented uh, democracies. I was chairman of the Foreign Ops Subcommittee, and, and we worked with the administration to, to, to do that. I'm also proud of uh, the, the added funding that we got through the years for, in, for uh, institutions such as National Institutes of Health and, uh, and uh, the, the, the additional money that we got for education programs across the board. Um, <clears throat> I am uh, also proud of the fact that uh, I, I chaired the Appropriations Committee and had the responsibility to produce the economic stimulus package, which was uh, totally misunderstood because people thought when you talked about the stimulus package, you were talking about the, the Wall Street bailout, which had actually happened eight months earlier uh, uh, under Bush's watch. Uh, I was in the chair uh, as, as we gaveled to passage the, uh, the Affordable Health Care Bill, uh, and, I'm, and, and I'm proud, even with all of its defects, I'm proud that that bill passed. And also, I'm proud of the fact that when Reagan produced his budget in 81, which, uh, which David Stockman later admitted was built on false premises, uh, I'm proud of the fact that I not only helped lead the, the fight against that budget, uh, I also uh, helped lead the fight against the Rostenkowski Democratic Alternative because I thought both of them would put us in hock for years to come. Um, and so I guess the, that's the way I would summarize what, uh, what, what I've tried to do. Congressman Petri? Yeah, I'm not sure it's any one thing. I, we all point to legislation, and I, I uh, led the charge some years ago to try to uh, uh, modernize and expand something called the Earned Income Tax Credit mm -hmm. to give people who are working and trying to support a family and uh, very low wages uh, uh, supplement based on their family size. And uh, I thought that's a better way to go than the minimum wage, really, because we're all contributing rather than just ordering some small businessman out of the goodness of our heart to pay some of his money when he might not be doing all that well to someone else. And it, it's a way of... Uh, maintaining jobs and entry-level jobs and helping people get into the work market better than, than uh, the minimum wage. That was passed, even though I was in the minority, uh, with the help of, of uh, uh, Tom Downey and a number of other people who were on the Ways and Means Committee at, at that time. Uh, I was on the Transportation Committee, and when I got on it, uh, we all pay it na nationally gas taxes, and it goes into a fund and then it's distributed among the states, and we were getting back about 70 cents on the dollar, and after I got my hands on that formula, we've been getting over 100% back ever since, which has been, and Dave helped on that, and that's been worth uh, uh, hundreds of millions of dollars a year to uh, Wisconsin and helps pay for that, all that construction going on uh, just uh, west of Milwaukee and all the, all the rest. Uh, I could go on about a lot of other things, but uh, I never served on the Foreign Affairs Committee. I was asked to do it by Bob Michael when I got to Congress, and I said, you know, Bob, I'm more interested in that than the people I represent. I think I should be on committees that, uh, that uh, deal with things that affect the, uh, directly the people that I represent. So I was on the Education and Workforce and the Transportation and Infrastructure Committee. But I said I'd be as active, I'll be help out as, as much as I can. So I was chairman for years of the U.S.-German Congressional uh, uh, Task Force Exchanges while well, Germany was reuniting and, and uh, also very active in exchanges between the U.S. and Japan and chairman of the American uh, uh, House of Representatives British Parliament exchanges and uh, the Queen made me an honorary officer of the British Empire and a special em Emperor of Japan <laughs> gave me an Order of the Rising Sun so I think at least they noticed what I did. That's great. I never talked about it much here because I didn't think that was what I should be doing. I'm going to take a few questions from the audience but I, but I had, I really have two questions but, but I'll, I'll ask at least one. Um, so based on what you know about politics today, based on your own career experiences, I see a few younger faces in the back of the room. <laughs> Can you advise uh, or recommend public service as a career to those young folks? Or is it something that, based on what you've seen and based on what you see today, you're not as excited about? Maybe as a younger man, you might not have done it. 
I can't advise people to do that if they want an easy life. <laughs> but I can advise you to do that if you give a damn about the country. Because we need that involvement. I mean, I know that people get pessimistic about politics and about governing. But understand that we've had huge changes in this country, and we will have huge changes in the future. If you don't believe it, just think. When I entered politics in 1962, we didn't have Medicare. We didn't have a, a Medicaid program that was worth a tinkers. We didn't have federal aid education. We didn't have student loans. Uh, we, uh, the, the, the budget for the National Institutes of Health was less than 10% of what they are today. And, and uh, uh, we, we, we didn't have Clean Air Act. We didn't have the Clean Water Act. Lake Wassa, where I grew up, was an open sewer. And when I visited my grandmother, uh, who lived two blocks away from 3M Company, before we could sit out on the porch, we had to take a wet rag and wipe off the furniture because of the junk that was coming from, from their smokestacks and landing on, uh, on the neighborhood. So over time, with all of its frustrations, this country has done pretty doggone well. And, and in the future, You've got huge challenges facing us. A little matter of saving the planet uh, by recognizing what's happening with, with, with uh, climate. Uh, we're doing tremendous, we talk about being an equal opportunity society. And in many ways, that is often bull gravy. If you take a look at what's, uh, I mean, education is the key to giving people equal opportunity. And yet, if you take a look at what's happened in this state, for instance, when I enrolled in college as a freshman in 1956, my tuition was 90 bucks a semester. The deal was that 80% of the cost of instruction was going to be paid by the state and 20% by students. Today, it's almost the reverse, 70% paid for by, by the uh, student and 30% by, 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 by the state. Uh, that has to change if we're going to provide equal opportunity for people across the board. So, so there are tremendous challenges. They're going to be hard to accomplish unless we can do two things. Number one is to greatly reduce the money, the, or the role of money in politics, which is why the most important issue facing this country in the next election is whether we're going to elect a president who will, uh, not just this the guy we elect now or the gal we elect now, but, but, but after, after they've served, we've got to elect another one who will appoint the right kind of people to the Supreme Court so that they will reverse or modify these court decisions on campaign finance. And the second thing we've got to do is to change the way we redistrict uh, legislative bodies because otherwise we're, we're, we're looking at a prescription for gridlock. And we need people to get into that fight. And so, uh, uh, you know, uh, by all means, I would encourage people to, to, to get your oar in. Congressman Vitra? Well, I, I define it a little more broadly because, I, as I said <coughs> at the beginning of the show, uh, uh, this, we've inherited and are the beneficiaries of a pretty good system despite all its problems. But it w won't continue or won't work well if people don't assume responsibility when they have the opportunity. First of all, getting them education themselves and getting themselves and their family established. But when they have the opportunity, giving something back through service, not just in partisan politics, at, in elective office at the national level or state level, but certainly on county boards and school boards and uh, 101 other ways that, that, that uh, help uh, our people have a better quality of life. We have a very aggressive, uh, competitive uh, uh, private economy. And it, 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 there's a lot of problems with it, but it drives for efficiency and spins off an enormous amount of wealth. And then we have a government sector. It's not too efficient, pretty expensive, uh, but obviously elements of it are necessary. We need to have also a big intermediating nonprofit volunteer sector, both of service clubs and people who are willing to volunteer, to kind of help make the system work 
uh, better. And if we don't, uh, someone else will do it. It won't work nearly as well. Uh, if people accept the responsibility, uh, it's, we're going to be, be uh, uh, young people are going to be fortunate for what they have to deal with. Let's uh, take a, a few questions from the audience. If you're in the seating bowl, press down on the rim, not on the ball, but keep your finger down on the rim. If you're in the back, Ryan is the person with the microphone, and he'll be able to take your question. How about the guy right behind you, Ryan? We'll start there. And, and please keep the questions brief, if you would. Congressman <laughs> Obi uh, stated uh, his uh, belief that reducing the amount of money in politics is the, one of the two most important things we can do. Uh, I think it goes right to the issue of uh, today's meeting, uh, the polarization. If lobbyists have bought you your seat or helped strongly in obtaining your seat, you're not going to bite the hand that feeds you and reject what they want. So if you have a group whose issues are polluting the environment and a group whose issues are cleaning up the environment, the Democrats will listen to the second group, the Republicans will listen to the first group. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> <There it is. laughs> I'm playing the role of Alex Trebek, and, I, and I, <laughs> we need it in the form of a question. <laughs> um, let me just point something out. If you're talking about lobbying, over the past 15 years, labor unions have spent over $490 million lobbying the Congress of the United States. Big business interests at that same time have spent $20 billion. So there is a huge investment on both sides and also a huge gap in that. I think that demonstrates that uh, there are a lot of people who will pay attention to what government does, even if uh, a lot of average citizens don't. Um, money. When I got elected the first time to the legislature, I spent 1160 bucks. Compare that to what happened in that same state senate district uh, two years or three years ago, when Russ Decker, who was then the Democratic floor leader, 10 days before the election, was comfortably ahead in the polls. And in the last 10 days, his opposition pour, or friends of his opposition poured in 500,000 dollars against him and beat him. Uh, that's, that's how big the problem is. And if you take a look at what the legislature did last week, they have now uh, made it uh, much easier for anybody in America to contribute any amount they want to contribute to any candidate or, or, or political unit without the public ever having any idea whatsoever that they've done it. So if you're a casino operator in Las Vegas and your nose is out of joint because of something the Wisconsin legislature has done, uh, you, uh, you can uh, send $500,000 to your favorite candidate and nobody will even know you're doing it. This system can't survive uh, with that kind of a situation. And there, are, I mean, forget the Republican Democrat. The fact is that both parties have become far too comfortable uh, with the money. The, re the main reason I quit is because I represented a marginal district. I always worked like crazy to, to try to uh, make it look like it was a safer district. But after these court decisions, I knew that if I was going to survive, I would have to become a glorified telemarketer, dialing for dollars half of every day. And I didn't get elected to do that. I didn't, I didn't have the stomach for it. Do, do you share his concerns about money? I think it's a very legitimate concern. And I do think that uh, when people attempt to deal with it, they've got to do their homework and, and uh, look at the Constitution and make sure what, what they do passes uh, constitutional muster. Or if it doesn't, they will find that things that they've done made things even worse, which is what we found the last uh, round. I supported the 
with trepidations because I wasn't sure that some of the uh, McCain-Feingold things would pass co constitutional muster and they ended up not doing it. My approach has been more, uh, and you, I mean, money in politics. Some it used to be someone owned uh, uh, the Milwaukee Journal or something. They run editorials, pretty important in the campaign. Doesn't cost them anything, uh, but the newspaper is a pretty valuable asset. You, uh, radio stations, I guess, they can do editorials. Other people do editorials. Uh, that's not money directly, but it certainly is influence, and it. People who own those those things are often very wealthy. So you say they're not supposed to, be, do they have free speech or not? Are they able to express their opinion? It gets uh, more complicated. My thought has been that it would make more sense to encourage uh, 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 small contributions, make it easier for people to, to uh, uh, contribute to the party or candidate or cause of their choice. And uh, because, uh, the effect of money in a particular campaign is a diminishing asset in the sense that you, you spend $5,000 and then someone else spends uh, $100,000, that's not 20 times as much. The $5,000 will get the word out uh, fairly well. Just spending more money doesn't automatically tr translate into more votes. There's a point of diminishing return. If you can encourage people, as you saw with Obama last time or with, with uh, Sanders now or with Car Carson's another one, others raising large amounts of small contributions from real people, uh, participating in the process, give them a tax credit or a deduction for those contributions. I think that will encourage po uh, participating in po politics and it will reduce the impact of the uh, of, of fat cats uh, without running afoul of the Constitution. Let me take one more question here. Anybody? There's a gentleman way over there, Ryan. That's the way that works, you know. <laughs> I know. And just keep it brief, if you would, please. <laughs> OK, so the snippet for this uh, included uh, what people might be encouraged to do for participation. I think the root problem of this, and I definitely agree with both of your fundamental issues, is that People should matter and could matter more than money in politics, more than lobbyists in politics, more than special interest. I'm proposing and have a model for what I'm calling a Peace Corps for democracy. Any ideas in your years of experience, how you would implement such a thing, what the obstacles to it has, have historically been? I mean, it's 240, 50 years now. It's an age-old problem. I guess I don't understand the question. What okay, do do I, I think size? we need to find an easy, enjoyable, and effective way for groups of people to participate in their local communities. Well, the most effective way to participate in activities is to call up your local party chairman, either Republican or Democrat, and ask them how you can get involved. I mean, the way I got involved was very simple. I was in the, I was in the seventh grade, and... Uh, I started reading about uh, about the issues in that election. I wound up taking my sister's uh, wagon, tied it to my bicycle, and I wound up peddling uh, literature for Republican candidates all over Marathon County. My mother was a Republican then, and I was too. I, I, I've been doing penance ever since. <laughs> <laughs> but but uh, uh, I simply went down to headquarters uh, it started doing the, the literature distribution, helping with the mailings, thing, things like that. And uh, it was simply working in party headquarters that enabled me to meet Jack Kennedy, Hubert Humphrey, Mo Udall, you name it, uh, all of these people, just by being in campaigns and working. So that, uh, but but if, if you don't want to do that, and if you want your politicians to do something, then you've got to, you, you've got to have uh, local organizations who uh, will, 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 will insist that that is an issue that's of high import to them. And they've got to try to round up like-minded people to put pressure on their legislators. There is no magic formula. Well, I'd say it's, it's amazingly simple to run for office if you just leave aside all the all. I discovered, uh, I got involved. I didn't call up any party chairman or anything either. I just discovered I lived in a 
State Senate District, which as the result of redistricting by the state legislature uh, in uh, April, uh, was going to not have an incumbent person. And I lived in it, and I, well, how do you run for that? I looked up the law. All I had to do was go down to the courthouse and get a f piece of paper uh, and collect 400 signatures and uh, I file them, and I, my name was on the ballot. And it, it, this is, uh, you know, people can run themselves. They can if, uh, encourage other people who they think might do a good job to do that, or they can offer to help. Uh, ringing 400 doors, asking strangers to sign your nomination papers. There's more than 400 to get 400 signatures. Sure. Uh, but that's, just, that's not money, that's just effort. And uh, it's never going to be completely pleasing because you're dealing with the nature of politics. You're dealing with people who have different perspectives and different ideas and, this, and different objectives, and you're trying to get them to work together. And it's not always a pleasant, pleasant process. Uh, but we all find the same thing in our families or any other thing when you're working with, with uh, our church group or you name it. Uh, but it's important, and it's very easy to get involved, certainly uh, at the... Uh, local and at the state level, uh, it's a little harder when you get into these 600,000 population congressional districts that we, as we've spoken about and, and national, national office. I'm going to wrap things up there. Um, before we go, uh, as we often do, I, I'd just like to let you know about some events that are still to come uh, tomorrow morning in this room, starting at about 8.30. Uh, we will be doing a, a half-day conference on the future of the American Public Library. Um, which we think is going to be very good. Some uh, uh, national speakers will be joining us to talk about why libraries still remain uh, remarkably relevant in today's world, even despite all of our technological advances. Uh, on November 4th, the uh, new president of the Milwaukee Bucks, Peter Fagan, will be here. Um, on November 10th, uh, 10 a.m., actually 9 a.m., I want to make sure of that, 9 a.m. in this room, uh, we'll be doing a... Uh, a uh, an event that looks at the future of the near west side in Milwaukee. There's a lot of stuff going on in this area near Marquette and uh, just to the west. And we'll be talking about uh, some of the efforts that are underway to uh, make this a, an even better place to live and to work. And then on November 18th, the chief judge of the Milwaukee County Circuit Court, uh, Judge White, Maxine White, will be here uh, to talk about some of the uh, criminal justice issues facing our community. So having said that, I'd just like to thank everyone for their time, their interest, and their attention today, and we'll see you next time on the issues. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you.